Hey there, welcome to Broadcast to Post. I'm Jeff Sengpil, CTO at Keycode Media. This is the show where we interview leaders and experts in the AV, broadcast, and post-production spaces. We're giving you the inside tips to grow your media workflows and business today. Hey everyone, today we're getting into building a video studio in 2022. We'll be joined shortly by some of the greatest broadcast engineering minds on the Keycode Media team. The panel will be discussing the trends, the standards, and the things teams need to think about before building out their studio and control room spaces. But first, I'm going to attempt to introduce this quite daunting topic and take a shot at leaving you with a checklist that will help you complete the discovery stage of your studio project. It's important to remember this. Once you complete the checklist, you are still at the beginning of your journey. Just looking at manufacturer tech specs and lining those all up isn't going to cut it. A majority of products that many assume to be plug and play or easy to connect with other products, they just really don't work that way. Contacting your systems integrator, like the engineering team here at Keycode Media, about your ideas and plan is essential to having a good outcome. The KCM team successfully deploys over 700 audiovisual, broadcast, and production projects, as well as upgrades each year. With that level of experience, we can get you on the right track at all stages from design, implementation, or that necessary 24 by 7 support. Working in collaboration with our partner network of over 500 product lines, including folks like Grass Valley, Ross Video, Sony, Panasonic, NewTek, Everts, Chauvet, Ketoflow, Sennheiser, Clearcom, and, well, you know what, you get the point. Let's put together the checklist of things you need to think about when your boss says, hey, build me a studio. For the sake of time, we're going to assume that this is a net new studio and not upgrading part of a workflow in an existing space. If it is an existing space, you can probably skip a good bunch of these questions, but also add a host of other additional questions about compatibility with the equipment that you already own. The checklist. Our core questions. Objective, budget, timeline. We need to start our team off with the most foundational questions, making hard decisions with everyone on what ultimately is the use of the space. Changing ideas mid-project will cost your team a lot of pain and will almost guarantee you miss the mark on your budget and deadline. Money. Here are the questions. Generally, what will the studio be used for? What are those deliverables, folks? What is the budget? What is the timeline we're all going to need to complete this? And then let's move on to the space, the floor plan, and the set. So we start with the purpose of the studio, the space, and the staff, and the environment. Depending on if you're looking to put a live-to-tape podcast or a television program with a live audience, you'll need to make different decisions. Here's some questions you need to get started. Floor plan. How much space will we need? Is there going to be a separate sealed control room for the technical team that was going to be required? Acoustics. Is our space acoustically treated? Are there potential sounds outside of the building that can bleed into the building? Planes, trains, automobiles. Grounding. Is the concrete or steel grounding in the building done properly? Cable routing. Where are all these cables going? What are going to be your cable paths? Check to see if the ceilings are high enough to allow for raised cable trays that could possibly be mounted in the ceiling. Room color. What's the current room color? And is that going to need to change? Yes. Access to the building. Is there going to be a loading dock available to bring all that heavy new equipment inside? This is going to be essential also for moving in and out rentals and possibly set pieces. Electrical. How much dedicated power is available to the space? Where are the current wall outlets? And do they need to be moved or added to? Is there going to be backup power available? Where are you going to prefer to connect your devices? Will there be cabling coming out from a wall? Or are you going to need a panel on your wall to connect things to? What types of connections are you going to need available? SDI, XLR, fiber? Or is the plan to rate, run this facility largely Ethernet based? HVAC. What considerations do you have for separate HVAC? Using your existing HVAC will not be enough, especially when you add hot lighting and LED walls. 
Another consideration with HVAC is the amount of noise that's generated. Typical HVA systems are not geared to be quiet and move a lot of air. So don't forget your server rooms and control rooms as well in the HVAC discussion. Ceiling height, this is really important for lighting and rigging. What is the height and the weight capacity of your ceiling? What obstacles are up there? MEP, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, all those considerations. Do you have sprinklers? Internet connectivity. What is your current internet capacity? Are you planning to use Wi-Fi in the space? You need to also plan for spikes in your internet usage while you are in production. Public access. What's going to be the opinion of visitors to your reception area? And how will you be able to accommodate audiences for studio shows. You need to make sure there's plenty of parking and you need to make sure you have a place to hold an audience that's not out in the sun prior to letting them into your studio space. What is gonna be your building access during the install? What level of access will you have to the space? Set and furniture. Is there gonna be a set or is the space gonna be multi-purpose? Should we have plans for use of green screens or LED virtual sets? What type of furniture might be needed? Do you enough, have enough space to load furniture into the building? What sort of doorway clearance is available, both height and width? Now, let's get to equipment decisions. Ultimately, the equipment decisions are gonna come down to the final outcome of your budget and deliverables. If you're looking for a cinematic feel, you'll probably put more emphasis on large sensor cameras. While a podcast might put more emphasis on good audio with cameras that are set and forget, like a PTZ setup. Camera systems, is this going to be single cam or multi-cam? Is it gonna be mixed use? Is the plan to build and equip for the dominant use and then rent for the occasional needs? What is the camera and the outputs required? Are you gonna need these large sensor cameras? What is your resolution going to be? Where's 4K figure into all of this? What about your delivery platform? Getting to the cameras, what is the difference with distance between the talent and the camera? How is that going to impact lens and zoom decisions? Are you in need of teleprompting? What will the camera operators and crew look like? Manned or unmanned with PTZ cameras? Choice is up to you. Lights, is this going to be a static or a flexible lighting grid? How often are you gonna be changing lights out? Speaking of lighting, is there a plan for background LED or maybe even XR VR walls? What's the lighting operators or crew going to look like during production? Truss and rigging. What's the estimated weight of the lights you plan to hang? Is the initial plan to hang from the ceiling or use ground support? Are you going to need seismic protections? Things get a little shaky in California and a light is going to cause a little bit of damage on its way down. Audio. What kind of microphones do you need? How many? Do you need a PA system to play audio inside the studio while you're recording for that audience? Control room requirements, play out. Is the output going to go to broadcast television or is it YouTube or maybe both? Does the feed need to play out within the studio or in the building itself? Graphics, are you gonna need graphics like lower thirds? What about graphics that require live data feeds like sports and weather? Your video switcher, how many cameras and what type of cameras and devices need to be accessed throughout your production? What source types do you wanna plan for today? And what about the future? Lighting control, are we gonna need access to all the lighting devices from a single control unit? Is it preferable to have it all pre-programmed with presets or controlled manually by a staff member during production? Audio control, is this gonna be a separate space from the control room for those loud folks over there. Encoders and decoders, are you sending signals to other studios, the internet, or maybe even satellite? And are you receiving things from the outside? Comm systems, will communications be limited to in-studio or are we gonna need to bring in stakeholders from the outside? Who needs access to comms? Furniture, is the plan to have custom professional consoles? We also wanna double check if the furniture is flexible for future changes and growth. And is it gonna fit through the door? You laugh, it happens all the time. Remote contribution. Is there gonna be a need for remote guests or remote cameras contributing real time to your production? 
Is there going to be a need for remote control of your cameras, lighting, or remote contribution from directors, producers, sponsors, or other staff? So your rack space. Is there an appropriately sized area for your servers and other racked gear? Is it going to be quiet enough to not impact the studio areas? Does the space have adequate cooling? I'll say that again. Does the space have adequate cooling? Let's keep in mind, this is just the start. There's going to be many more questions once you present these questions to your system integrator and the manufacturers you're looking to partner with. So a word of advice, engage with us early if you can, and then we'll get the band together soon. Keycode Media, a broadcast post-production, keeping your head on technology. All right, let's transition over to our live stream podcast discussion uh, with these top industry minds on the Key Code Media team in West to East Coast order. Mark Siegel, Steve Dupay, and Robert Well Brown. Gents, thanks for joining me today. Um, first of all, let's get into the trends we're seeing in video studio builds of late. Let's start with environment. Why do you need a studio? What are the ideal environments for building a studio? Uh, Robert, what do you what do you think the uh, the answers are for environment there? Um, in the studio, it gives you a controlled environment. You have controlled space where you can keep stuff consistent instead of uh, moving around all the time. You got the same setup. Well, setups can change, but you got the same setup so you can keep everything consistent. Sounds good. The, the big reason to have a, a studio so you have control. Definitely. Um, any other thoughts? Steve? Yeah, it, it is all about control, the controlled space, controlled of environment means you can control the lighting conditions. You don't have external lighting coming in. You can uh, control the acoustical. Um, those are the, the primary two elements for, for having a studio is a controlled environment where you can artificially create, in a sense, any environment that you want to create through lighting, sound, and scenery. And because to today's um, production environments uh, the, the the quality of production that we're trying to produce is is constantly increasing. Uh, uh, a studio gives you a space um, in which to idealize the the kinds of of uh, production quality production value that you're trying to generate. Um, doing it on the fly, having to set it up every time, uh, just takes too much time these days, and uh, and creates too much inconsistency in what you're producing. And I would I would just add there that scheduling. If you're trying to do this in conference room three and happen to have a uh, accounting meeting in there on Thursday, that could give you a little bit of a problem. Uh, all right, next let's transition into IP versus traditional SDI. It gets into a whole standards discussion. So uh, what are, would you say the application and benefits are for IP versus SDI or a hybrid environment? Where are we seeing the main reasons that folks are beginning to switch to Ethernet based versus I, SDI, or are they still living in a hybrid environment? What are these network considerations going to be when they go all Ethernet? Uh, what about SMPTE 2110 standards? When does that make sense? There's a, a heck of a lot to unpack here. Uh, Steve, let's uh, kick this one off with you. Okay, um, IP is a is a great transport mechanism for getting uh, video data signals as well as lots of other audio um, and control signal uh, data uh, from point A to point B. The the real driving force for it is in reducing the amount of, of cable loads that you have in in a system. If I'm building a, a small studio, probably not going to be a 2110 or even a 2022 or IP based solution. It probably be uh, either a, an SCI or uh, uh, an NDI type of solution. The, the key thing there is, is what economy of scale fits, what, um, what data rates are needed, uh, what kind of future expansion might be needed. Um, so you have to really pay attention to those things because you can get yourself into a real world of hurt going one way or the other um, if, you're, if you're not looking ahead. Choosing technology for technology's sake is never the right idea for a studio. Choosing a technology that reduces the labor, um, increases the speed with which you can deploy new technologies, that's the solution you're trying to look for. Definitely. Mark, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously one of the considerations when building type studios is proximity from studio, and we'll get into this a little bit later, to control room. Obviously, we have limitations within network unless we get into trunking. Uh, switches. 
Um, you know, there's lots of advantages to IP-based technology these days. You've got lots of signals going down that one Cat 6 cable. Uh, it, it, it's nice, and you can distribute that signal to multiple places without going through traditionally baseband routing solutions, right? Uh, remote contribution fits very well into IP as well. If you're bringing off-prem signals into a into the studio, that's very helpful. Uh, you know, a lot of our technology has transitioned to platforms like we are using right now, Zoom, Teams, stuff like that, or other type of remote platforms to bring in remote contributors. That's where IP plays the role. If you want something consistent that's always going to come up, um, you know, the traditional uh, Simpty Fiber, Triax, Coax is pretty reliable type stuff, but requires uh, purpose-built hardware to do that. Yep, and it, it takes a lot of space as well. Um, and, and if if you're building a a, a studio with lots of cameras or other other signal uh, paths through it, you got to worry about the the space and the conduits and the cost of uh, putting in uh, that conduit infrastructure. Yeah. Well, the, the one thing I would say also that's interesting with IP based as opposed to, um, to traditional coax is it eliminates patch base. That's one of those things where you, we don't think about it until suddenly we're, we're wiring it up and you realize this is, this is a network switch. Everything goes there. There is no way to patch around a failed network switch because it is basically it is the router and the core. So it, it changes the mix of what you're doing in, in a control room, in, in the machine room, um, and in the studio as it, it just comes down, like my, uh, Mark was saying, that one pipe, whether that pipe is copper or fiber, uh, it makes things a little little interesting there. Um, yeah. Rob, any thoughts on there? Yeah, I think one thing to add on to with Mark is um, less install up front. One cable compared to three or four cables plus the material cost for that, you know, with one cable compared to four, you, it dramatically reduces that cost when you're starting a new build. There, there, there's one other thing to consider here as well is that we, if, if you're looking to build a, a 4K or UHD uh, production studio uh, or environment, one of the key things that you're going to run into is the, the cable lengths that are, are, are available um, uh, running 12 gig SDI, you're, you're going to run out of room in, in under 50 meters. Um, the, the cable lengths just cannot be uh, that long. Um, the signal uh, jitter and attenuation is just too great. So there's other technical aspects that are driving us towards either compressed signals or putting us into the IP domain, which then solves that problem and allows us to scale up going forward. Definitely. And I think one of those things is that, that cost consideration that was just mentioned. Um, while you can do IP inexpensively, sometimes less expensively than SDI, if you're getting into a 2110 environment, it's a horse of a different giraffe because there's there's a, a part there that can be rather costly uh, today. Um, you know, we, we were on with one of our, our uh, 2110 vendors the other day and they, they were saying minimum 256 by 256. Most folks don't necessarily need that level of um, complexity in their setup. So uh, cost is going to be one of those considerations there as to what you're going to do. And now that we're talking about costs, let's, let's branch over to just costs in general. What are the costs of considerations? What's the cost of your construction? Yeah. What's the cost of safety? Um, and getting those folks in to do the work, to build a studio with the various skill sets. Um, start, Steve, let's start with you, the cost considerations on building. The, the, the biggest thing you got to watch out for is, is the, the kind of the hidden cost. You can, it's pretty easy to, to take a look at a, a range of gear and say, hey, this is what it's going to take to, to pr produce my, um, my studio workflow, to build my, my uh, production chain. But the, the hidden costs of, of labor to install the, the conduit, the, the conduit runs, uh, if you got to um, do any shoring up um, of, of uh, walls and, and other structures, if you're going to hang a lighting grid, um, is there, do you have the structural integrity to, to hang a heavy grid? Do you have to go with something lighter? Do you have to have, make it freestanding? Those are the kinds of things that you really need to put a checklist together and carefully detail and, and generally estimate 30% higher than what you think it's going to be because that's probably where it's going to land. Um, and those gotchas, it's, it's really sad. You, you, 
you have this beautiful idea, you've got uh, clients that you're, you've got lined up and, and you kind of make that mistake of thinking the gear is just, the, the, that's, that's my biggest expense when in fact, those hidden costs of infrastructure, um, handling the AC, um, dampening things, um, the, the, having the structural engineer certify what you're putting in there. That's the, the gotchas that, uh, that, that usually eat your budget for the equipment and then, then compromise the quality of your production. Definitely. Mark. I would, yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, you know, a, when, when people say studio, studio can mean many different things to many different people, right? Is it an insert studio? Is it something where you're going to have a studio audience? Is it, you know, those type of things. Construction costs will always traditionally outweigh the cost of the technology that you're putting in. You know, um, there are cost-effective ways to take small rooms, conference rooms, uh, virtual rooms, and convert them into controllable environments. You've just got to be considerate about the surrounding environment. Okay, you've been given a 2020 conference room on the third floor of a five-floor building, right? Um, and you have been tasked with converting that to, oh, we're going to convert that to a studio. Well, there's lots of considerations. The noise coming from above, below, you know, how high is that ceiling? Because, you know, typical newscast television studios, as you kind of see in my virtual background, we're hanging lights at 10 and a half feet. That's LED type of lighting. We'll get into that a little bit later. Some studios have higher grids uh, based on what type of production that they're doing. There's a lot of physical considerations when building the space, but if you're smart about it, there's, there's ways to do it cost effectively. Remember, at the end of the day, all that matters is what's in the raster and what is being recorded or transmitted, right? The rest is all make-believe. So, but, but, but you gotta, but you gotta make, certain things can, can make that cost effective. So you gotta be careful about the construction. Definitely. I, I always love the concept of suspension of disbelief. That's really what we're all about. <laughs> uh, Rob, any further thoughts on the cost? I think cost, uh, one other thing to consider is your, uh, the sets, the hard sets, you're going to have hard sets in there and what you're going to have for that. And those come at a expense as well. You know, I think that's just one thing that I don't know, Steve, when he was talking about with the, uh, kind of like the, the grid and everything is just uh, the cost of the sets that you want to have made. If you're having anywhere, you go to a virtual set as well. And, and, and that the attention to detail on, on all of those things, because if, if, if you're going to shoot, um, uh, 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 UHD production, you want to make sure that, that you're not going to pick up little blemishes and other things on there. So that attention to detail becomes really important. And you gotta, you gotta kind of take that into consideration in the terms of the quality of construction, quality of layout, um, and, and then ongoing maintenance. Definitely. Okay, so we've got the set, we've got the studio. Let's get into, how are we going to see this? Camera trends. So what are the different types of applications for large sen sensor as opposed to a small format or opposed to a PTZ camera? Uh, what are we seeing folks go with cameras and studios today? Mark, let's start with you on that. Yeah, it is all over the uh, all over the place. Uh, you know, we have people shooting with cinematic cameras. We have people shooting with UHD cameras. We have shooting people shooting with HD cameras still, SD cameras even still. Um, I think it's your final endpoint. You know, where is where is that distribution going to go? Is it going to be a cinematic release or whatnot? Um, you can do multicam cinema cameras. We've got some people doing that. That's really popular or a trend that's happening in house of worship. Uh, even though they are only, you know, they're streaming the majority, so they're streaming out in higher resolutions. Um, you've got, the, you have to dis determine whether you're going to have manned cameras or PTZ cameras. You're going to throw cameras on jibs or cranes or, you know, other uh, sky tracks, those type of things. So, you know, a, a lot of considerations. I think it's a combination of all these various tools to be able to achieve uh, the goal and understanding how you can get the most out of the best investment of a tool. Uh, we see a tremendous amount of transition in studio to PTZ, uh, not live audience studio like talk show, but, you know, very simple, a lot of corporate stuff because a lot of people just don't have the resources to be able to have on a three camera shoot, three camera operators and half the time, two of the three cameras are in lockdown. 
anyways, you got one person tugging three cameras. So, you know, trends, obviously, you're going to see the disappearance of HD cameras. You're only going to see UHD 4K based cameras being manufactured because that's what people are doing. It's becoming just as cost effective to manufacture those chipsets as well. And then we're going to start getting into higher resolution stuff. You know, you hear the 6, 8K. It's, it's just going to continue to grow as our industry grows. Um, you know, there's just considerations on how you build your sets. And as, as those resolutions keep on going up, they're going to require different things with light. So that's my two cents. Definitely. Um, a couple things I, I would say there. One, uh, while the, um, while a, a larger format camera that was manned, what, it can do a lot more in a production. As we learned from the, from the beginning of the pandemic, you couldn't have people there. PTZ also offers you the ability to control them for remotely, either remotely in the same building or remotely from another building. Uh, you know, from home. That's that. That's one of the things that kind of uh, exploded as uh, as we all locked down. Um, any other thoughts on cameras? There, there's there's a couple of the key things that I think sometimes get overlooked um, in selecting a camera. One of the key things you want to make sure that you're aware of is what signal formats you need out of the camera, and if the camera can support multiple formats um, or even direct streaming, if if, if that's needed. Uh, for a lot of the PTZ cameras, the, those kinds of capabilities really enhance their value um, in a studio. So even if you have one or two man cameras, having a couple of PTZs that you can you can easily um, uh, control, manage, and and get signals out to where you need them directly makes a big difference. The other one that people always forget, they, we think of the cameras as, as being lens. all integrated. It's the lens. Um, you can you can buy a really expensive base and put lousy glass on it, and you've thrown your money away. So never, never, never forget to, to look, take a close look at the quality of the glass you're putting on in front of that imager. That'll make a huge difference in your production. In fact, putting decent glass or good quality glass on an okay camera makes a big difference. And it, 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 it's, it's hard to explain. There's all kinds of uh, uh, physics and optics that uh, we, could, we could get into that, that cause that uh, chromatic aberration, um, other spherical aberration, other things that happen. But it's really important to take a close look at, at the glass that is in front of that imager. Yes. Definitely. And making sure that the glass is suitable for the imaging format you're using. So some people have tried to use HD glass in front of 4K, oh. and that doesn't necessarily work out well. That expensive lens you bought a couple of years ago doesn't work when the format of the uh, imaging sensor behind it gets changed. Exactly. Well, and the thing is, the, the other piece about imaging sensors is they require light, light to allow things to be seen. So let's let's talk about lighting. Um, we've kind of moved away from the days of uh, you know the heavy and hot park hand lights. Um, what trends are we seeing today in studio lighting? What other parts of the production factor into the lighting decisions? Uh, Steve, let's start with you on that one. Yeah, the, the cool thing with about lighting today is is that it's it the both the uh, the quality of the lighting has come up while the um, uh, the cost has come down. It's now possible to 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 invest in in all kinds of nice bar lights, uh, pars, um, etc. Uh, that are full RGB um, and and have good color uh, gamut control on them, uh, so that you can get the the right lighting and depth that you that you want. And if you're doing any kind of green screen activity, um, that becomes really really important. Um, being able to to, to dial that in. Um, Investing in a, in, a, in a good lighting controller is also really helpful so that you can get consistent effects. You know, we're talking about um, the speed of production and the quality of production, reproducibility. Having an appropriate controller with the lighting uh, that, you, that you, you invest in really helps to get that consistency. You can keep those levels the same and the LEDs will, will stay generally in, that, in the, the correct temperature range. You do have to watch though, because they do age just like an incandescent bulb. And, and the color will shift. So making sure you have your color charts, your chip charts available, that's, that's, that's really important today as well. I could, I could add a little bit to that. Um, well, when, when you say LED lighting is coming down, yes, in some areas, but you can go out and get an airy panel for six, $7,000 and spend an awful lot of money on a single fixture. Um, 
that's the trend. Don't buy them. Don't necessarily think just the name is going to give you the good light. There's many other considerations. Just because you have one of them doesn't mean you're lighting right, right? Um, I, I think what you have to look at is, yes, we've been through a transition from incandescent to CFL, which is compact you know, fluorescent-based lighting, uh, which there's still an awful lot of fluorescent lighting out there in current uh, studios, television studios primarily, newsrooms. There is a transition, obviously, to LED. Um, it's obviously, it, it cuts down tremendously on your heat loads inside of your studio. Uh, you know, there, there is a reduction in, in cost, a significant reduction, because most incandescent lights, they produce more heat than they did produce light. <laughs> um, so you were using air conditioning to cool the studio significantly more, significantly more power. So your power costs will go, go down. Also, there's a lot of energy trusts in areas which will subsidize the replacement of incandescent light at this point for LED or more cost-effective fixtures. So look to your power companies for rebate. Um, lighting, lighting is, for me, lighting is almost everything. Um, you can't capture good images without light. And to properly light things, you should do it, plan your zones in your studio, whether you're gonna have your stand up, your interview, your you know two person, various zones in the area. Um, Steve had mentioned a good controller. Make sure you've got a controller that can control the multiple multiple universes because a single fixture, unlike in incandescent days, was just dimming up and down. A single fixture may have 16, 24 controls on it, right? To be able to call it, change color temperature, change intensity, change lots of different things. So that, that's pretty good and pretty important. And, uh, you know, you can you can do an awful lot with with light. Definitely. I mean, that right now here, I'm, I'm actually sitting in a studio. There is an incandescent backlight hitting the back of my head. I have LED front lights for key and fill, and those are matching the color temperature of the incandescent light. If this gets changed to a different fixture, we can actually change the color temperature of the set. Also, the, the interesting thing is these fixtures here, if I wanted that to look like a, a, a squad car coming in, flashing red, flashing blue, flashing red, flashing blue, VFX is possible, in, or you know, effects are possible with lighting these days that we didn't even think of back in the day. We'd have to actually, you know, I, I remember seeing uh, in studios, people would bring in old light bars from squad cars and they're mounted up there, they got a 12 volt thing, so they could make it look like that. I can do that with the same fixture today. Um, also, the, and we're about to transition into video walls. The, the interesting thing also is if you've got a video wall behind you, it's a light source. But also it's a light source that doesn't contain orange. And that's going to be a consideration for adding light to that because if you are lit solely by a video wall that happens to surround you on three sides, if you don't compensate for the orange, you can't even fix that in post. Everything looks cold and, and um, like an old daguerreotype or something. All right, let's move on to video walls. Um, XR stages, extended reality, uh, AR, VR, XR, LED walls are all trending topics these days. They're, they're hot topics these days, literally. We'll talk about that too. There's a, a host of considerations that you need to put into place and how that's going to impact your overall lighting decisions. Um, what do you need to know about before committing to an XR stage. So, uh, Rob, why don't we, Rob, can we start with you? And if, if you've got anything there, and then we'll bounce right to, to Mark. I'd say, you know, looking at the, your, your pitch on the, uh, on the panels themselves is a big, what you're going to be using as your processor and what you're really going to be doing with it, the size and, and what, how we just talked about a little bit about the lighting with it as well. I mean, the, those are your major things I think you need to look at, basically pitch because that's huge, and um, the size of what you're looking to put in for your uh, wall. Mark. And with, uh, sorry. Oh, remember, with remember that thing. With that as well. Yeah, I'm sorry. Remember, remember that thing that we talked about in studios where we just put in all these beautiful LED fixtures and re reduced the heat in the studio? Well, now you just cooked it up. <laughs> um, video walls consume typically a very a tremendous amount of power, and they put off a lot of heat. 
So now all that air conditioning that now we're not building studios with, because we went to LED walls, now we have to up our air conditioning because these walls put off an awful lot of stuff. You gotta be really careful about scan frequency rates. Mm -hmm. Not every camera will work well in front of a VR set. The matching of those is critical because then you'll get more rang, you'll get scan frequency lines that'll run up in your screen. That is a very critical thing. Not all video cameras do well in VR environments. That, that, that's really true, Mark. Um, and, and one of the key things to, to pay attention to, and I, I always recommend this to clients, is if you're, if you're considering an XR screen, you need to take the camera that you're planning on using and the lens and get that in front of the screen with talent at the kinds of depths that you're anticipating having sets, et cetera, so that you, you can see where those moiré patterns show up. Um, you can get the right depth of field settings on your lens and make sure that the pitch that you've got is is correct and it's interesting sometimes uh, uh, a larger pitch um, led wall um, works much better than a finer pitch and there's a big cost difference on that so you may actually be able to save money by paying attention to to the, the combination of lens camera and uh, video wall to, to get that in the in the right balance so it, it, it's not just you know a finer pitch um, more expensive screen is going to give you a better result it's the balance of all those things together yeah and and with video walls in the background 80 percent of the time you're going to jam that light output down tremendously because uh, light coming off of a led which is a direct light source out of these video walls right very intense light coming out. We have a tendency to turn the walls way down as far as uh, luminance output, yeah. right? Otherwise, you just have to, in order to light the subject, you have to throw a tremendous amount of light in to front to light up the subject. So it's, it's, it's really a good balance. Obviously, we keep light off the panels as much as possible uh, because then we're just throwing light on top of light, which is more light. And it's all reflective light. Um, so it, 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 it takes a little bit more experimentation for those that haven't done it, or, or you bring in somebody that has had the experience to be able to assist you in, in making that look good. Uh, it's a very nice way to do production because you constantly change your backgrounds, right? You, you're putting somebody in an artificial environment all the time. And one of the other things that, that ties in with that, Mark, is as, as, as you change the luminance on the LED wall, note that the, the, the color range changes as well. So you, you, you have to, it's a good idea to experiment and, and get some presets so that you can, you can get the, the, the color registration correct on that background because it, it, it will shift on you as, as you as you bring that back. The other thing that I'll mention, it, it's, you know, we always think of light sources, but uh, we don't oftentimes think of light suckers. Um, I know that's a that's probably a, a different term than you've heard before, but I'm talking about drapes and reflective surfaces. Um, you got to make sure that that you are absorbing or diffusing the light that you're generating from from video walls, as well as making making reflections um, uh, look correct um, on on your in, in your studio on your on your set. Um, and we do that with with appropriate draping, um, with appropriate appropriately um, uh, painted surfaces, etc. So it's not just the light generators, it's the light absorbers as well. Definitely. And the other thing to also to think about, and we'll, we'll get into this in, in just a second, is the difference in audio. The curtains behind me, if that, if that was glass from a wall, my voice will sound different, especially also if it goes away around three ways. Um, so that, that's something to, to think about as well as we get into audio and sound. Uh, so let's let's start off with uh, kind of the infrastructure part of that. Let's get into Dante versus uh, you know traditional XLR with analog. Uh, what are the challenges customers are facing <clears throat> with audio? Sorry, <clears throat> audio and studio design uh, within a space. What trends are we seeing? Um, Rob, let's start with you on this one too. Uh, more and more Dante. Just uh, simplicity of it. You can route it around where you want it to go a lot easier. Is it just uh, all going over a network switch instead of having hard lines between equipment? You can just go and grab and route where you want your audio to go to. Yeah, yeah. multiple channels on one cable makes life. Yeah, it's better. it's uh, you know when it comes to audio, first of all, studio, isolate external 
vibration, external sound. That's the purpose of a studio is that you have a um, unity environment, quiet. Uh, if you don't, there's cost-effective ways to treat that. You know, you don't have to go into a studio and throw rock wool up and K3 up all over the place. The most cost-effective way to acoustically treat a room is put a curtain 300 and, uh, you know, a good mill curtain, 40 mil, 20 mil curtain, 360 degrees around that room. It's going to be the first thing you got to do. If you got noise coming in from the fourth floor, we talked about the studio before. Oh, the cafeteria is right above us. Oh, great. That, that ain't, that ain't going to work well. Or you've got noise coming from downstairs or from the sides or from HVAC or from transference of vibration from steel coming in or the mecha mechanical plumbing pipes go right above your ceiling. And every time somebody <laughs> flushes, guess what? You get a flush. Um, so those are the those are the considerations as far as technical trends are concerned. Obviously, remember all microphones are analog devices, right? Yeah, we're picking up sound off of an analog device. How quickly do you want to get it out of that analog environment into a digital environment? Um, you know, Dante's great. It's a great way to distribute, get get stuff around. But obviously, we got to come out of those analog mic prees and get into a desk or a mixing environment where we can record this audio. Um, That's exactly the, right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Mr. Audio, the, go Mr. Audio. There, <laughs> there, there, there's so much that can be done with uh, with all the modern tools. Um, once we get into the digital domain, lots of processing, lots of lots of uh, cleaning up of, of background noises and, and those kinds of things. But you can never overcome the loss of gain um, right at the front end. Um, most people forget that every time I cut the distance between me and the microphone in half, I increase my my output level by by 6 dB. So getting that microphone as close to the mouth as possible um, makes all the difference in the world in terms of improving signal noise ratio and isolating yourself from from uh, from background noises. So never affect no never forget the the, the key aspects of uh, of of good analog audio production. Um, it's always a good sign um, when somebody has thought through and, and there's a lot, you see lots of boom microphones hanging around. Um, things that, that, that get the microphone out of the picture, but get it as close as possible to, to the talent. That's actually what I have. I, there's a, I have a nice RA20 microphone sitting underneath me that's on a long boom so that it's out of the camera shot completely, but it's, it's right there um, as close to my face as I can, as I can get it. Those kinds of, of old school techniques still are still very valid today with all the cool digital tools that we have to, to get lots of audio signals around and get them processed. Definitely. I mean, it, 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 it's an audio transducer that we're, that we're dealing with and making sure that the, what gets to the transducer is the, the best possible thing. And then making sure nothing interferes with that down the, down the chain. That's what we're most interested in. I mean, in, in the space I'm sitting in, you know, we, we are a cement floor. However, there's a, I'm sitting on a, a Persian rug. That's, we just have it sitting under the set because it picks up extra sound and, and baffles it out. So we don't have that echo going on. Um, and we're, we're analog and then we combine into digital up there. So, you know, you just, you figure out what's best for your, your particular environment and make sure that also the environment is covered in terms of, you know, if you get that LED wall in and you start pushing a lot of extra air, this could possibly generate a lot of extra noise, and you have to look at that piece as well. Um, let's, uh, I think we've got knocked out all the audio stuff. Let's get into some of our audience questions. Um, someone from CalArts is asking about the cost of acoustic treatments if you're keeping a hard surface floor. I've got some interesting points on this, but anyone else want to go first? I mean, not, most studios have a hard surface floor, unless you're going to a rubberized anti static dense type floor, right? Um, but most of them are either floating or leveled concrete floors because in some studios, we actually still use dollies. We truck back and forth and stuff like that. Um, the floor is, is usually a solid surface. Most of the sound that bounces is lateral in a room, right? Uh, as you project sound out this way, it is a, a lateral projection. So you've got to really treat Obviously, walls, hard surfaces uh, come up with, uh, you know, um, 
different 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 angles. That's yep. why a nice curtain, wavy curtain with fifty percent fullness is really helpful because it really does a lot, a lot of a lot of sound treatment. Uh, obviously, you know, one of the, probably the most important thing is ceiling is really important to treat. Uh, you know, I'm on the Pacific Northwest and we've got a lot of people, we got something called rain, right? Rain, rain causes problems on roofs. Um, you got to treat those. And when I talked about the K3 uh, spray and that type of stuff, I, I know people that spray K3 through an entire studio or they put rock wool, rock wool up the walls, K3 on the top. Um, it's just deadening that room. And we have tools that we use to help assess that room that we can help consult you with. We, you know, we use ease and we can plot the room out. We can find, uh, find out where, where the bad spots are. So getting back to the hard floor. The hard floor, what you wanna do is you wanna put where, where it is not visible or where you are not working, you wanna try to put down sub-absorbing type of material. Simple, rugs. That's why you always see a rug down. Yep. And I can speak to what we did in this space. We used to have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in this, in this space. And the, this space is probably 40 by 60. Um, and it's probably about a 20-foot ceiling. So the audio back then sounded like garbage, despite the fact that we had carpeting down. So we took out the carpeting. We put baffles hanging from the ceiling to pick up that audio. And then we've got wall baffles. So the audio inside this space is a lot better than it used to be, despite the fact we've got a very highly reflective floor. We also have the, the curtains behind me. Um, and if anyone's familiar with the key code Burbank office, the one thing we can't take care of is there's a train track 50 feet from here. This studio does not belong here. We don't have a choice in the matter, but sometimes we'll have events and you hear the you know, the, the 515 out to Ventura going, going by. It just It just happens. And that's, that's one of those things we couldn't fix. We're, we're not going to be able to fix inside the room. Um, but the other pieces we can. All right, let's go into, Joan is asking for HD 1080. How much of a limitation is it if your studio was built with Cat5 cable, if you want to do NDI? Um, Rob, you want to get a, an idea on that one? We ran in the eye over cat five. You just come down to a, a uh, limitations. The, honestly, replace it with cat six. Put, put cat six in there. That's the best route to go. And you're, you're upgrading for the future anyway. So you're, you're getting a little bit of uh, insurance when stuff happens in the future, you'll be protected. But you, you can do it over cat five. I, it, it's not recommended. At two fifty, at two hundred and fifty bucks for a thousand feet of Cat Six, good Cat Six shielded. It's it's the it's the best investment that you could possibly do. Yes, it's labor, but uh, you know, just use the Cat Five to pull the new Cat Six. Exactly, pull strings are in the wall. That's right. I mean, I, that, that's a good point. You know, the, the, the quality of the shielding and the, the isolation between the channels makes all the difference in the world in terms of the data rate that the cable is capable of handling. And and don't forget that that that. Those data rates can uh, can affect and leak out of that Cat Five um, into other things. Uh, grounding in, in in a new studio with all the digital signals passing around becomes more and more of an issue, and it it can it can surprise you where where those ground loops show up, because it, it's not just audio; it'll show up in your video as well. Yep, and and this even is over Cat Five E. Um, the the pairing inside of Cat Six and greater cables is is differentiated, and the shielding is differentiated. The other thing we've learned from a lot of studio builds is if you put in a shielded cat six cable, there's amazing things that it also can do. You can do protocol conversions and run uh, like RS422 or 485 down that. So um, that's that's one of those pieces there. All right, we've we've kind of run out of time and I think we've gotten a lot of stuff covered. Um, if you have further questions or you have a studio you're you're looking to build, please reach out to us here at Key Code Media. We've got a slew of experts that can get into all the, the details and the nitty gritty of your production, both on the, the engineering side and on the sales side. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, we, we've got access to all of the, uh, the, the wide range of different possibilities out there. Help, let us help you. We can, we can get this done for you and get you through that checklist that uh, is extensive uh, and may not, may not 
all of it may not per particularly pertain to you. So, uh, you know, my apologies to uh, to uh, all the all the other folks, and let's uh, let's call it a day. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks all. <laughs>